let me start with the environment. And I think it is almost ob obligatory now that we start all discussions with the current economic environment. In fact, it has become so bad that I am now learning French in the morning instead of listening, listening to the radio because it is so depressing when you turn on the radio each day and you hear the next crisis, the next problem that's occurring. And it strikes me that there's a danger in any of that environment that we allow that to force us to make decisions that in the end are not the right decisions for us all. We clearly are in an environment today of, of global turbulence and you see this every day. Um, later this week in London you'll see the G20 together discussing the same issue. First the financial system, then the automotive industry, then looking at the global trade, the risk of protectionism. And in all of that it's very easy to say I, what I really need to do is save. Um, at Intel we've always believed that you can never save your way out of a recession. It just basically doesn't work. And so what we do believe, however, is, is well signed up, is well uh, summed up in a, uh, Swedish, uh, a Swedish saying or proverb, Nuden er uppfinning ernas muder. And I, my wife will kill me for that pronunciation, but I think the heart of that is really appropriate, and that is that crises is the mother of invention. That any time you're in deep trouble, and the example we gave here is in sailing, where you're well behind doing more of what you've been doing will not cause you to succeed. You will not get a different outcome by doing the same thing. You need to change what you're doing. And these times are when change is going to be what makes us successful. Now, innovation is the core of this, but innovation isn't the only part of this. And at Intel, we, we look at this environment and we say, first of all, this isn't the first time we've had such an environment. We've had approximately 10 recessions, at least three of which have been as serious or more serious for our industry than the current one. And first thing we learn now is that you need to maintain your capability to compete and to innovate, and that means investment. And the first part of that is on research and development. Research and development is is absolutely critical. And what you see when you look at that chart is that despite the fact we had the dot-com bubble and the, dot and the telco bust and the 2004 recession, etc., you don't see a big change in our R&D investment. Research and development continues because it's necessary because Moore's Law won't allow us to slow down. The second area is we can't do this ourselves. When I talk to other individuals in our industry, you realize that the world needs innovation. Most innovation comes from small companies, comes from smart individuals, comes from universities. And it's critical that we continue that innovation in those places. Uh, we just recently announced a network of, of laboratories across uh, Europe to continue innovation, to take innovation do the basic research, do the productization, and then commercialize that out in the marketplace to help people with the entrepreneurship of that. That network is based on our belief that when we speak to governments, we don't need help. What we need is we need governments to educate and produce smart people, to invest in research and development to create great ideas, and then create an environment where the smart people can get together with the great ideas and create companies and employment and wealth, and that industry will do that quite well if they're allowed to, to get ahead and do this. So in that environment, though, we created a, a wide range of laboratories across Europe, and not just on those sites, actually, but we actually work with the National Supercomputer Center here in Sweden, in Linköping, and they access these labs to get access to the latest technology and to enable cooperation on some of the grand problems. And I'll speak a little bit more about those grand problems in a minute. We also invest in, in manufacturing and process technology. And what you see here is uh, a, a view of some of our construction sites that we have going right at the moment. We invest, this year we announced investments in seven billion dollars in new facilities to build our, our, 30, uh, <clears throat> our 35 nanometer technology. This will enable dramatically r lower costs, greater integration, and more innovation. So that's going to continue just like the R&D. 
So the next part, if we look at it, is innovation. This is the core of Intel. Since the time we were formed, we were focused on Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is one of these amazing things that someone could casually say in 1965, you know, I think this technology can double about every 18 months to two years, and 40 years later, find out he's still right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's fairly astounding uh, ability, and, and, and the fact that the industry has kept this up has been incredible. And as you see, we've followed that line and actually have gone above it in a number of areas. But the important thing isn't just that this means I can have my costs every year and a half, or that I can double my performance, but it means that the things that I do are disruptively changed. There's a point where it makes sense to put a microprocessor in a light bulb. There's a point where it makes sense to give everyone their own supercomputer instead of having them submit big jobs. There's a point where you can predict the weather. And that's the disruption that Moore's Law brings to us. Now, an example of that here is back in 1993, the number one supercomputer in the world cost about $25 million. It was the TSMC uh, C5. And it had a performance of an astounding 13 billion floating point operations per second. It was amazing. In 2007, your notebook had the same performance. Now think about that, from 25 million to your notebook, sitting with a glass of Chardonnay in the garden, had the same performance as that supercomputer which took up the room of your garden. Today, we're announcing a new class of servers and workstations that no doesn't give you 13 gigaflops, but 92 gigaflops on your desktop. So a tenth of a teraflop, you know, a teraflop was the golden uh, target for all uh, supercomputers just several years ago on your actual desktop. 